Uh, we heard from Jean-Paul and Ronald earlier today about the shifting focus from pension funds and sovereign wealth funds towards sustainable investing. And what we'd really like to do in the next panel is very much hone in on the returns part of that equation. So how to drive good returns from doing good, because I think we established earlier on today that there's, there's no mutual exclusivity. You don't have to have sustainable investing or good returns. They are definitely intertwined. Uh, I would like to invite my panelists to join me on stage. We have uh, Stephen, Peter one, Peter two, and Russell. So please welcome uh, the next panel to the stage, which is driving returns through sustainable investing. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, I actually want to start with a, a quote from uh, Lady Lynn Forrester de Rothschild that she said in Vegas earlier this year, and she spoke about the power of markets to make the world a better place and that we should all be aiming for capital markets and capitalism, which is strong, trusted, sustainable, dynamic, and inclusive. So with that sort of context of inclusive capitalism and sustainability, if you could just introduce yourselves for a minute for the benefit of the audience. Great, thank you. I'm Peter Hughes. I'm a founder and CEO of Apex Group. Uh, you know, we're a financial solutions business globally. Uh, we have financial solutions, fund solutions, corporate solutions. Um, we've been in this region for 13 years and we've been the first fund administrator in the ADGM. Um, and I, I'm fully supportive of exactly what she was saying in terms of we're rolling out a business called uh, Greenlight, which is to look at how people can measure how good the companies are that they're investing in from all those angles. So it's not just going to be about profit first, it's about which businesses are doing the best they can for sustainability and then how good are they within that category. Uh, and that's what we're really trying to focus on and add value to. Mm. Excellent, and we'll come back to the points on data and technology later as well. Steve Barnett, I'm Executive Director responsible for business development within Abu Dhabi Global Market. And uh, sustainability is something that we've, um, that we've really focused on over the last couple of years, partly as part of the, the broader uh, World Future Energy Summit that we, that, we, uh, that we support here in Abu Dhabi, which is the biggest sustainable event in the MENA region. And we last year launched a sustainable finance uh, forum as part of that, leading to 25 organizations, both public and private sector, signing up to the Abu Dhabi Declaration on Sustainable Finance. It's something we're very passionate about. We see it as part of our responsibility to, to promote sustainable investing it, through this region and in this region as well. Excellent, thank you. Russell. Hello, everybody. I'm Russell Reed, uh, the former Chief Investment Officer of CalPERS, the uh, Gulf Investment Corporation, Kuwait and also the Alaska Permanent Fund Corporation. Um, um, most recently, I uh, founded the Sea Change Group um, out of London and uh, in the U.S., focusing on transforming the utilization of natural resources around the world through uh, the identification, development, and application of game-changing technologies. And my name is Peter Leyer. Uh, I uh, have been in the region here for the last 12 years. I uh, had the benefit of working with Russell for four years when we were in Kuwait together for GIC. Uh, currently, I work with a family I've known for many years here in the re here region, uh, based in Abu Dhabi, called Al Maskere Holding. And uh, for us, I would, uh, would classify the business as taking the ESG uh, narrative and taking a bit backwards and saying, for the family, governance have always been a critical element in everything we have done over the 50 years we've been in business in Abu Dhabi and across the region. Social impact has always been part of both the investment side, the operating side, the partnership we have had, as well as also, of course, the philanthropy work the family has been involved with. And more recently, I would say the E side, the environmental side, has become increasingly important. And I think what we are trying to focus a lot on now is saying how can we as a family, as a private sector player, help uh, Abu Dhabi built the narrative around creating a gateway for the broader region by attracting particular institutional investors and institutional capital to invest via 
Abu Dhabi to the broader region, a region we determine as Miasa, Middle East, Africa and South Asia. And in that, along that narrative, we launched the first project together last year in ADDM, together with Steve, and with Alaska Permanent Fund as the backer, where we launched a, a public equities fund together with a US SEC regulator manager, McKinley Capital, and launched that in Abu Dhabi for international institutions to invest via Abu Dhabi to the broader region where we believe institutional investors can have a lot of impact and can help transform that, uh, that region. Mm. So maybe let's just dive a bit deeper then into that emerging markets focus, because I know you've all had experience working in emerging markets. Why and how are emerging markets such a sort of hub for sustainability investment? So I, I would say that, uh, you know, obviously it's, it's a growth theme, that's why people want to invest in it, but it's uh, a really where, you know, you've got to invest in the right sort of growth. Uh, and because they're emerging, you know, they're behind in terms of, um, you know, the right practices around sustainability. Um, and, and that's really why it's important to select the, the right ones to invest in, because it, it's much harder to select given the fact that they haven't had the same focus or the, or the same luxury of being able to pick and choose how they build their businesses um, with their drive for, for growth. Um, so it, I think it's, it's a much harder, harder balance selecting exactly which company should be invested in in the emerging markets, but the, the value is there. Um, but if you screen out for sustainability, then, then actually you can actually get to the right population to pick from. Mm. And are you seeing within your respective areas the most opportunities in the private markets or the public markets? And could you maybe talk about the differences between the two? Yeah, so I, I can make a comment on that. I think that, um, so first of all, to the first question about EM versus developed. I think if we look at the region, we are domiciled within here and we see Abu Dhabi to be the gateway to this broader region. As we termed it, Miasa, right? Uh, 88 countries, 52% of the global population and where basically the growth of the world is going to come from. If you are to have impact, you need to think about what you do in this space. The challenge is today that it's often hard to find scalable investment platforms where you can really have impact. I think that's where private equity and the direct investment theme become a lot more important as we speak, right? So I mentioned before we launched the public equity strategy. Now we're focusing as much on creating the private equity sister slash brother to that strategy. Again, with, an, with, an, with a focus on creating platforms of a scale, of an equality, where institutional investors can come. And the private equity is just a better way to have the impact and the more direct influence over what you're invested to. In other words, you, you have a significant stake and a significant ownership and can thereby impact harder. Mm. And, what, and maybe just get your view as well, Steve, from the regulatory perspective. How are you seeing the private markets within that? Is it you know, easier or more challenging to regulate? It's, it's important that we, we regulate both public and private markets in this. It, it, our focus has been very much on a couple of different things. One is, one is around getting transparency. Whether it's public or private markets, we've got to have, have transparency to make this thing work. What I mean by that is, is that you know, if we're sitting in Paris or in Frankfurt or in New York or San Francisco, it's, it's relatively straightforward to identify those things which meet people's investment criteria around their sustainable needs. It's not so easy in this region. The information is provided in a different way, whether it's public or private markets. So what we as a regulator have to do and what we are doing is providing a, a, a structure and a framework which brings that transparency to investors that, that enables people to be confident that if they've invested in something with a specific set of sustainable criteria in mind and uh, they're, they're confident that, they, that it really does meet that, that it continues to meet that throughout the life cycle of the investment as well. Um, so that's one of the key things that, that we're trying to do. And yeah, it is important that we're able to provide that level of granularity to people because what's sustainable to me may not be what's sustainable to you or to, or, mm -hmm. or to the Peters or to Russell. Um, looking at it through the lens of this region, you know, clearly oil and gas is extremely important. And we see a lot of people that, re that recognise that 80% of the world's energy is still provided through hydrocarbons. And we can actually probably make more of an environmental impact, more of a sustainable impact, by greening that old brown economy 
than we can by investing in another megawatt of solar. It's not to say we shouldn't do that, but it's, it's just where people want to make their difference. And so, regardless of which of those you want to do, we should be providing frameworks and platforms that enable people to be confident and transparent around what they're doing. And that's one of the cornerstones of what we do as a regulatory framework. Mm. And I guess, you know, that ties in with the, the growing population as well, obviously, with growing population, uh, high rising incomes, there's a greater global need for energy. So we may as well at least make that energy Absolutely. more efficient. And you know, we can't, those of us that, that grew up in the so-called developed world, we can't really take a, a moral stance which says it was, it was okay for us to use hydrocarbons to build our economies because it was the cheapest alternative source. But we want you to use something which is more sustainable as you do, as you continue to develop your your own economies. If we look at Africa in particular, that that's a it's a real problem. Availability of electricity and energy is, is a major challenge. I think what we have the responsibility to do, uh, and I include the, the what what we call emerging markets here in in terms of the people with responsibility to do this, is bring the technologies that we've developed, bring the opportunities that we that we've brought to enable people to support people in developing worlds to perhaps use older technologies but in a more sophisticated and modern way so that we, we make less environmental impact. There's a balance to be had. Mm. Fabulous. And Russell, I know that you've had experience, but particularly in, in Africa and some of the other emerging markets as well. Can you give your viewpoint, perhaps from the institutional investor side? So, one thing we've heard earlier in this conference is that the emerging markets are a very poor label um, in that um, there are many different things happening across the emerging markets. What we do see in the region from Africa through India and Southeast Asia is that it is disproportionately important on a couple of levels. It's, the, uh, it's half the world's population now, um, but it's going to become uh, even a greater portion of the world's population. Um, uh, by the end of the century, Africa is estimated to have almost the same population as Asia. Um, uh, by the middle of the century, something that we sort of see, the, the US, which is the third largest population in the world, will become the fourth largest population. Uh, Nigeria will have 400 million people by the middle of the century. <coughs> um, so when we think of the population growth story, it propels the consumption story. The, the growth and consumption of the world is going to be driven by this region um, from, uh, from Africa, Middle East, uh, into South Asia. And uh, it also becomes the natural resources story, and it becomes the pivotal climate and environmental story. So we have this region of the world which has been an afterthought um, for most institutional investors. Um, even when they began investing in the emerging markets, many of them focused on just the BRICS, or even like China in particular. Um, the rest was an afterthought. This afterthought becomes the story. And so one of the decisions we made at the Permanent Fund is that we didn't want to be late to this game. Um, we uh, weren't necessarily going to invest all of the fund you know, up front, but we didn't want to be late to it because there is going to be a disproportionate amount of uh, quality op uh, opportunities, particularly related to natural resources. And so I guess that ties in, you know, nicely to the theme. So emerging markets, but also some of the issues around data and measurement and getting the quality projects as well. Can you perhaps talk a bit more about what your, your clients are seeing and, and what you're seeing in terms of the ease of measuring sustainable impact and good returns from these markets that you're looking at? Um, we see that quite a lot, you know, providing the, the services around you know, asset managers and family offices in terms of what they're looking at. And really it's driven from the allocators, you know, the big pension funds globally, the sovereign wealth funds. They're asking you know, the, the GPs, the investors, you know, what is your ESG policy? What is your ESG program? How are you monitoring how you invest the money we give you? How, how are you checking that it's, it's invested in the right way? So the portfolio companies, of which I'm one, um, would receive a questionnaire, you'd fill it in and send it back, and then you don't know what happens to it. You know, they, they collect the data, but then it's how do they make that meaningful data? Uh, and so we're trying to bridge the gap to be able to consistently, independently, look at how private companies are behaving towards 
the environment uh, and the social and governance pieces of what, what's, what they're operating in and then be able to report back to the GP and then ultimately the allocator to say actually that's a great company or that isn't a great company. Um, and I think it's really important to be able to get that data into the right format because it really isn't there yet. It's beginning to happen and, and people are beginning to make sure that they're investing ultimately in the right sorts of businesses. And it's particularly hard on the private side, so on the public side, you know, there's pretty good analytics and data you can get very quickly. But on the private side, yeah, the, the really, it's very hard to get proper consistent data um, and independent data as well. So I think that's going to be a real theme as people look to make sure they make the right investments. Mm. For me, there's a couple of levels that this comes through. One is the data which enables you to be confident that something genuinely does meet the criteria, as we talked about before. I think that's becoming increasingly available. We're seeing some wonderful things coming through with use of smart contracts and blockchain recording, sharing of data, that sort of thing. We're seeing companies coming through that are providing direct linkages through into financial reporting, through, uh, through smart solutions, and that's great. I, when, you, when you talk about what are investors looking for, uh, investors are always looking for better risk return. And you see two groups of investors, one that, that are genuinely looking for doing well by doing good, and the others which don't care quite as much about the, the doing good part of it, but want good risk return. My contention is that if we understand the risk, uh, the, the differences in risk between the sustainable projects and those which are traditional, if you will, that we should see lower risk profiles through the, through the long run. I don't think we have the data to demonstrate that yet, but intuitively that should be true. And if we can start demonstrating that in a better way and we can get equivalent returns with lower risk, then it should be compelling to invest in this type of thing. And maybe part of that is about really understanding the risk factors that we ought to be taking into account when we're making those risk return decisions. And some of that will include things like cost of recovery and cost of restitution at the end of a contract, or potential fines and liabilities as a result of, of failing to meet environmental criteria. But I think we've got to get that analysis going through in a better way. And we see some of the rating agencies starting to, to make progress on this. And then people will, will allocate more because the risk return calculation is clearer. Mm. So do you think it's more, uh, I guess, a difficulty in obtaining that data, or it's just that there's not enough of a time series yet to I make? I think there's, there's just not enough of a time series. And also, we're not really looking deeply enough at the risk factors that we bring into to account when we look at the, de the time series of data. So I think it's a bit of both. Mm. And Russell and Peter, how are you seeing the risks, and particularly with regards to data? I know, Peter, you do a lot on the quant side of the equation, which obviously requires yeah, a huge Yeah, in the strategy, we do it all together with the McKinley Capital and Alaska Permanent Fund, which is a public equities fund. Obviously, we have access to more data sources, right? And, uh, and that's invested in frontier market as well as EM markets across the region, right? And as, as Steve's saying, clearly we're getting better and better data to be able to judge both from a risk point of view, but as much from an impact point of view or an, and sustainability point of view. On the private equity side, it is obviously more data scarce, right? And we have very much the view that sitting in Abu Dhabi and we have a very, very well-regulated platform here where we can establish ourselves and invest through. You need to invest locally. If you are to invest in Bangladesh or Kenya or where it may be, you need somebody local close to the data, right? And in that approach, where we have less data, we are very aware that we need to work closely with local investors, right? So we have a network of local top tier family investors that we are investing alongside. Because short of that, there's no way we can justify, neither from a risk or from a sustainability point of view, what we are getting into. So that's really the network effect where you need to get close in shortages of data. At MSCI, uh, where I was uh, recently a member of the executive committee, there were a number of uh, important things. So MSCI is a provider of data indexes, ETFs. Um, <coughs> from a data perspective, uh, the one fact that sort of hit us is that the amount of data worldwide, there's this there's this uh, interesting statistic is generally doubling every every two years. Every two years, you have a doubling. Um, so not quite as fast as computing power, but it's a dramatic increase in data. And for the uh, for the business at MSCI, um, the fastest growing part of the business was ESG data. Uh, ESG data used by institutional investors. Um, 
and uh, so a great business, the fastest part is the ESG data, and the, the, uh, that was just focusing on the public markets, but the demand for private market data uh, regarding um, energy impact, for instance, is tremendous, whether it's from real estate to infrastructure um, to, uh, to other real assets. Um, I'd say that the, the hunger for data to help drive uh, impact investing in a positive way is not going away. Mm. And so how is, or how can investors, I guess, differentiate between leveraging that amount of data that's out there and not getting overwhelmed by it? You know, given that it's doubling every two years, how do you make that differentiation? Well, I think organizing it in ways that is digestible for investors, we heard earlier from uh, APG, uh, from uh, Ronald, that um, they were sponsors of GRESP. Um, so uh, it was providing a framework to, to evaluate real estate uh, from an environmental impact perspective. We're going to see more of that. Um, so I think the, uh, you're right, it's not just having more data, it's organizing it well. But I think it is a driver. It's, um, it's a, uh, you know, it's not just uh, as benchmarks. Uh, it's, uh, it's a, it'll provide a means of investing. It'll provide uh, guidelines for how you do conventional and impact investing. So for impact, um, I think it is the single biggest way to institutionalize the practice. Um, if you, if, so transforming it from um, sort of a, uh, a hobby uh, to something of institutional quality, I think the, the institutional quality uh, data needs to help drive that. Mm. And if, or assuming that we have that data, where are you seeing the most investable projects from an institutional perspective, given that you know, many of the audience members and yourselves are from an institutional background? I'm not investing, so I'm going to leave it to the investors. No, I, no, I think it again comes a bit back to, uh, you know, at what scale are you trying to get impact and how can you best get that impact right? And I think, as I mentioned before, I think certainly the private side, the more direct side, you can have more impact, one. But two, in order to get the scale, you need to probably break down some of the barriers we typically have seen in the investment world, right? There's been very typical classification of how do we carve up the world. There's been a very, very typical way in how we cow out asset classes within the world. And I think if you are to get to these, you know, let's call them exciting, scalable, institution quality project, you still need to break, you need to move some of these boundaries. It's not just about bricks. It's not just about thinking developing versus emerging markets. It's not just about thinking your public, private, debt, whatever type of strategy. You have to build in a bit more flexibilities in your strategy in order to get the scale by A, expanding your geographic view and taking a more thematic view on that, and two, looking at a bit more flexibility in the asset classes. That also means in some cases you will do what would broadly call alternative investments or special situation types investment. And that takes a bit of education with institutional investors typically, right? Because they are typically organized by asset class and by geography, right? So you need to carve a bit your way into those institutional investors and get sort of broader narrative across then I think we can create these ones, so I'd say emerging market, and obviously a bit self-serving, we like the Miasa, Miasa geography, geography as a place where we believe you can have a lot of impact as an institutional investor. I think the thematic approach is actually particularly important. Um, there, are many, there are so many countries, for instance, in the Miasa region, 88 countries, so how do you make sense of the opportunity? Um, and the themes, uh, some of the major themes, such as the increase in agricultural productivity of the average African farmer, you know, how important is that? It's actually not just an African issue. It it's it's, could be arguably the single most important food security issue for the planet is increase in the productivity of the African farmer. Uh, other themes, uh, microgrids, oh, how important are microgrids? Well, the decentralization of energy in places like Africa, another giant theme. So these giant themes are going to become investable. Um, and uh, so I, I think they're also going to provide an organizing principle sort of to uh, distilling many opportunities into uh, some themes that are coherent and institutional quality. Again, the institutional quality piece of it, I think, is the biggest transformation that's needed in places uh, like the Miasa region, where there's inherent need for investment, 
but you, know, you might have a trillion dollars of core need for infrastructure investment in Africa, but a trillion dollars could not invest well in, across Africa today. Uh, there aren't enough bankable projects. So uh, the bankability of projects, creating institutional quality opportunities, that is, I think, the next big uh, shift we're going to see. Mm. The, um, so just, I, I said I wouldn't comment on it, but of course I will. The, um, the, one of the things that I'm quite excited about is that we are seeing more projects in this region. I think when there have always been a lot of projects which have moved towards more sustainable development, but a lot of those have been centrally funded. And we're seeing more opportunity for, for people to participate in them. So we saw recently Etihad launching a climate-related, a, a, a green-related um, uh, issuance because they're moving towards becoming the greenest airline fleet in, in the world. Um, you, see, you see the likes of our, of our oil companies doing more to invest in reducing the, the impacts of flaring, reducing the impacts of clean water. Clearly, we're seeing big infrastructure projects like, uh, like transportation projects, um, road to rail conversion, uh, and, and the like. But I, I agree. I mean, we all struggle with the scale of, of projects. And what we find is that there's a, there's a real challenge in that mid-tier range. It's easy, relatively easy to fund something which is a $100 million project. It's relatively easy to fund something which is a $5 million project. Between those the numbers, it's really hard to find, uh, to find ways of financing those things. And I think there's a real opportunity for private capital here um, to come into this space rather than bank capital, rather than, rather than public market capital, to come in there and take opportunities which arise in that space. So that's the, that's the area that I'm really excited about is finding solutions for. Mm. And if I can make a final point on the sustainability, so the, the, the clue is a bit in the title, right? So it's called sustainable investing, right? And I, I think we... we, we mistreat the norm a bit if we, if we think about sustainable investment just as about green investment. Sustainable investing also requires a sustainable return. Otherwise, capital will not continue to flow there, right? So I think that is the critical part also, to be able to create the return at scale. Sure. Otherwise, managers and, uh, will always be subscale to what the institution investors will make. We cannot get there, as you say, from today to a trillion dollars into Africa. But we get there step by step and requires different platforms to be put in place that can sort of scale over time and then grow with it, be it on the public or the private market or any other style of support. Excellent. Well, we are actually, unfortunately, over time, and I have been screamed at already today for running over time. So I would just like to say thank you very much for an interesting discussion. It seems like we've all got a little bit of work to do on sustainer, sustainability, but it seems like the data is there, the need is there, and now it's just finding those bankable projects between five and a hundred million dollars. So please join me in thanking my panel.